What's going on? It's the Polygon Don, and inspired by the spooky season of Halloween, today I'll be counting down the 20 most violent and bloody video games on the PS3, in my opinion at least. The criteria of the list factors in scale of violence and volume of blood before it considers whether the game is any good or not, so please bear that in mind before getting angry in the comments. But with all the intros and pleasantries out of the way, let's get on to the nasty stuff. Coming in at number 20 is one of my favourite games on the console and one I'm still patiently awaiting a remake or remaster for. Azura's Wrath, developed by CyberConnect2 and published by Capcom, is a game difficult to define. A story of betrayal and disloyalty amongst gods, the game follows Azura as he irons out some anger management issues he's having with his fellow demigods. At its core, it's a third-person hack-and-slash action game with beat-em-up style combat, but it's also a rail shooter at times, and most, if not all, cutscenes are these interactive experiences with quick-time events and context-sensitive button prompts. There'll be no resting on your laurels with this game. It's literally 100 miles an hour all the way through, with scene-stealing, attack animations and grudge matches that spill into the heavens. The scale of this game is insane and the violence depicted, although less realistic than some on this list, is just so awe-inspiring that it really does have to be experienced to be fully appreciated. It proudly wears its anime inspirations on its sleeves and they shine in every frame. There's not a ton of blood, but you can feel the brute force of every punch landed by these demigods as they fight each other, but hit Azura a little too often and you will inevitably feel his wrath, unleashing these super powerful special attacks once his burst gauge is full. The magnitude of some of these attacks are exactly what you want from a game like this, and the devs really outdid themselves in that department. Prototype 2 takes place a year after the events of the first game and to be honest either could have been selected for this list. I went with 2 as the combat is more refined than the first with a load of additional abilities and mechanics implemented to make traversal and combat even more engaging and fun. When US Marine Sergeant James Heller returns from touring in Iraq to find that his family have been killed by a deadly virus, he rejoins the military to combat the disease. Heller soon discovers the identity of the person behind the outbreak and pursues them in order to seek vengeance for his family. However, during a confrontation between the two, Heller is infected with a strain of the virus that instead of killing him, imbues him with superhuman strength and abilities. <laughs> Played in a third-person perspective and set in modern-day Manhattan, you'll be able to shapeshift into other people, assuming their identities and memories by consuming them. You'll use superhuman strength to hurl vehicles at groups of enemies, or utilise some of your newfound skills to hack the heads off of mutants. The devs give you ample opportunities and the convenience to let your imagination run wild as you play a god amongst mortals. A tale of revenge and deception, essentially, the story isn't really the element of this game that you'll write home about, but the open world playground in which you can experiment with your newfound abilities might be. Oh, my God. 
Drakengard 3 from legendary game director Yoko Toro of near fame is a very violent and bloody game. Stylized violence, yes, but violent nonetheless and incredibly bloody. I mean, it's up there in terms of sheer volume of blood spilled. Hack and slash gameplay with occasional aerial combat in the form of dragon riding, you'll control game protagonist Zero as she uses combos to effectively defeat her enemies. Doing so fills up a tension gauge which can be unleashed at any point to enter a hyperactive state called Intona Mode, temporarily becoming immune and able to move at a much faster rate whilst also dealing higher damage via her attacks. The plot is loosely a prequel to the first two games and sees Zero and her dragon Michael slaughter their way into Cathedral City, the center of power for the Intonas. Things go badly however and the plan is foiled, leaving Zero and her dragon to lick their wounds, get their strength back and try again. Featuring a protagonist that literally does not give a flying f it's a refreshing take on the hero protagonist but unfortunately an otherwise stellar game is at times crippled with frame rate issues. If you can look past the many technical problems and power through, you'll find an excellent game as most would now expect from such a talented team. The soundtrack is absolutely killer in this one too, with near composer Keiichi Okabe delivering the goods. Doom 3 BFG Edition, and no, BFG does not stand for Big Friendly Giant, is a HD remake of Doom 3 which originally released for PC and the OG Xbox, now featuring enhanced graphics, better audio and a checkpoint save system. As an added bonus, the BFG Edition includes all expansion packs to Doom 3, as well as copies of the original Doom and its sequel Doom 2, both featuring their respective additional content as well. Not a lot needs to be said about Doom, its unique brand of FPS violence and sci-fi horror has been a mainstay in video games since its launch back in the early 90s. But being a remaster of a game originally released in 2004, no amount of HD glow up is going to stop this game from looking a little dated when compared to other first person shooters released during this gen. The jaggies are still there and the facial animations of some of the characters are frankly laughable, but the violence and speed at which violence occurs is still present. Taking on the role of the last surviving member of Bravo team at the hands of some demonic beasties, you're asked to destroy an experimental teleportation device captured by the demons and taken back to hell before they can use it to send an army of demons to earth. Stepping into hell to save mankind will naturally be a bit of a nightmare, but the real nightmare occurs every time the game needs to load. Jesus Christ, these can occur at the most random of times too and take an absolute age, completely shattering immersion. So if you can stomach that, then you can probably handle any of the game's grotesque demons in my book. Still violent and gory as hell and still equipped with the ability to instill a genuine sense of fear and dread, if you're a fan of the series, the Doom 3 BFG edition is a must own for all the added content alone. Darkness 2 is a first-person shooter developed by Digital Extremes and is a direct sequel to The Darkness that released five years prior. Developed by an alternate studio to the first game, the sequel takes on a different look and feel overall, with it now donning cel-shaded graphics and fully embracing the comic book art style from the source material it's based on. In it you'll be running and gunning as Mafia hitman Jackie Estacado, complete with demon arms as he continues to be possessed by a mysterious force called The Darkness. 
brilliantly voiced by Mike Patton, the darkness guides and provokes Jackie to a life of unabashed vengeance and retribution, aiding him along the way via his tentacle-like demon arms that can interact with the environment, grabbing an object to use as a shield for example, as well as ripping out the hearts of the deceased to devour them for health. The way the demon arms can viciously tear apart Jackie's enemies right before his eyes is really something to behold. The Darkness can also summon a demonic familiar to assist Jackie in combat scenarios and in some of the game's environmental puzzles. Less mafia oriented and taking on a more cartoony look to its predecessor, you would naturally assume this might be slightly less violent, but it's not. The brutal and rapid gunplay is still there, the savagery of the darkness is ever present if not more so, as is the even larger arsenal of weapons at Jackie's disposal. A bloody and messy first person shooter with a demonic hook that grabs you and doesn't let go. Fantastic stuff. The fifth major entry in one of gaming's most beloved horror franchises, it certainly isn't one of the best the series has offered up over the years, but if we're comparing it to the others that released during this generation of consoles, then in my opinion Resident Evil 5 stands out by a fair amount. And one thing is for certain and very much a constant through any of the numbered entries, the repulsive enemies you come across and the horrid ways in which you can eliminate them never fails to impress and Resi 5 is no exception. Five years after the events of Resident Evil 4, you'll play as Chris Redfield as he is dispatched to West Africa to apprehend the sale of a bioorganic weapon on the black market. As you can imagine, things don't go to plan and all hell breaks loose, with the locals being infected by this weaponized parasite causing a torrent of infections to sweep through this part of Africa. With the continuation of the over-the-shoulder third-person perspective seen in Resi 4, You'll use an assortment of weapons to keep a distance between yourself and the groups of flesh-eating undead hungry for a taste. Standard survival horror tropes ensue as you run, shoot, but not run and shoot, through a maze of African villages besieged by this plague. Like I said, it's not the best in the numbered series, but not the worst either, and it definitely has its fans. What it doesn't lack, and a trend that is found throughout the franchise, is its creative ways of exhibiting death. A third person reinterpretation of one of gaming's most beloved franchises, certainly one of mine. Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2 or its prequel take the characters we've come to know and love and presents them as gorgeously rendered, more mature 3D variants. I chose the second game out of the two as I feel like the combat and the visuals are a marked improvement over its predecessor but you could easily pick either for this list. Playing as Dracula, you are naturally predisposed to not only defend yourself when in combat scenarios but should you feel peckish midway, old Drax will always make time for a mid-afternoon snack. The skills and abilities Dracula acquires enable him to slice, dice and glide through combat sections providing a really fast-paced and engaging experience. 
with genuinely grotesque enemy designs, especially the bosses, and abilities that involve the control of blood, you'll be seeing a lot of crimson as you play through this incredible game. I mean, even stone golems are seeped in the stuff, the game just can't help itself, but thankfully it's masterfully designed and presented. Split between the modern world and other more surreal environments, the modern cities do pale in comparison visually to say the gothic wonder of Dracula's castle, but the combat in all its blood-soaked wonder is just so addictive to play that it doesn't really matter where it's happening as it will soon be covered in swathes of red liquid anyway. Directed by Resident Evil creator Shinji Mikami for Tango Gameworks in 2014, The Evil Within stays in that same survival horror wheelhouse and follows protagonist Sebastian Castellanos as he is pulled through a distorted world full of nightmarish locations and horrendous creatures, desperately trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Played in the third person perspective, you'll battle disfigured monstrosities and nightmare inducing bosses using a combination of guns, melee weapons and stealth. Ammo conservation, stressful combat encounters and jump scares are all present, as one might expect from a game in this genre, but it does also come with a few new tricks up its sleeves too. Enemy reactions to your behaviour was a marked improvement over say something like Resi 5 for example. Not without its flaws, some of which were rectified with the PS4 release, its jank might be too much for some, but the creepy and cramped environments you find yourself in and the terrifying enemies pursuing you can still create a genuine sense of dread in an instant. The disgusting, blood-drenched horrors that await rarely disappoint here, so if it's blood and gore you're after, you could do a lot worse than the evil within. Of a few puny earthquakes. What the hell? Are you afraid of that? Shit. Shadows of the Dam, the third person action adventure from the minds of Shinji Mikami and Suda51, is a shooter with horror and survival elements that takes you on a journey into the hellish underworld the game is set. Our playable and unconventional hero, Garcia Hotspur, along with his talking demon sidekick Johnson, are on a mission to rescue Garcia's girlfriend Paula, who has recently been abducted by the game's baddie, Fleming, the Lord of Demons. With Johnson being able to transform himself into a variety of advantageous items such as a torch to see in the dark or a selection of firearms that can be upgraded as the game develops, Garcia can utilise his shape-shifting demon to devastating effect on the many hideous creatures the game throws at you. The atmosphere and tension this game offers is fantastic. Some sections have you trapped in a sort of darkness and whilst wave after wave of deadly night creatures stalk you, you need to figure out how to dissipate the darkness so that an escape route becomes available. Not the most violent on this list, though it doesn't shy away from that, but it does feature an abundance of blood and gore, all handled and presented excellently by two of gaming's greats. It's like a VIP. Very important pendejo. Something like that. Huh. Huh. 
No! No! Please! No! No! Please don't! Dante's Inferno from Visceral Games and EA is a third person hack and slash action adventure set in the nine circles of hell. It follows Dante, a troubled Templar knight, as he descends into hell to rescue the love of his life from Lucifer himself. Its dark and gothic world design is truly stunning in a kind of dreadful and horrifying way, but the incredibly fast and buttery smooth combat is what makes this game so enjoyable to play. Using a scythe and a whole host of combo attacks and finishing moves, Dante makes light work of the creatures and demons that dwell in the underworld as he journeys towards Lucifer. The attack animations of Dante and the death animations of his victims provide this brilliant mix of visceral violence that on more than a few occasions feels more like a dance than a duel. Dante's scythe can hone in with heavy attacks on one particular individual, but is just as adept at carving through multiple enemies with devastating 360 degree swings of destruction. Then there's the cinematic splendour of boss battles. The odd quick time event allows the camera to get right up in there, taking you as close to the bloodshed and brutality as possible. The game throws a lot of enemies at you and a varied bunch at that. There's the odd environmental puzzle to complete that occasionally breaks up the combat, but I'd say that at least 75-80% to of this game is pure carnage produced at a AAA standard. Often rather reductively cited as a mere God of War clone, this game is so much more than that and offers its own unique standard of violence well worth experiencing. You could, like many series that feature on this list, pick any one of the entries, and in this instance I'm picking the less appreciated Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z as the one to showcase out of the Ninja Gaiden series. As if we're using blood splatter and violence as a metric, then this spin-off wins hands down. I'm definitely not saying it's the best in the series, so chill out if you just grab the hold of your keyboards in disgust. I'm just saying that with its more cartoony and cell shaded presentation, it often takes more liberties in terms of depicting violence. Yaiba just feels a lot more over the top and in your face overall. Even the ultimate technique mode, which featured in the mainline numbered entries, has been replaced by a mode called Bloodlust here, which when activated allows Yaiba to destroy multiple enemies all around him in furiously quick succession. A third person hack and slash title, and just like its predecessors in the series, it does feature many elements of those games, but it just has a vibe all unto its own. It's not generally remembered all that fondly by super fans, and I do think it gets judged a little too harshly a lot of the time. Playing as Yaiba, a ninja killed by mainline series protagonist Ryu at the start of the game, its setup, look and overall sensibilities definitely sets it apart, but it's that arcadey quality and sheer over-the-top violence that gives it its individuality and keeps you playing. Everything's just been cranked up to 11 in this game and I'm totally here for it.
pretty sure the M rating attached to our next game was awarded for the consistent use of profanities and immature innuendos over anything else, but Bulletstorm certainly isn't bashful when it comes to over-the-top action and gratuitous violence either. Foul-mouthed idiot Grayson Hunt will be your main protag as he makes a series of unforced errors that lands him and his crew of ex-Black Ops soldiers turned space pirates into troubled territory. A first-person shooter that rewards the creativity you can muster when it comes to murder, the game provides ample opportunities for outrageously inventive kills. You can boot an enemy into the air, giving you a window of opportunity to empty a round of ammunition, or you can use one of the many more exotic weapons the game provides you with, such as the leech that allows you to pull a distant enemy into a wall of spikes, for example. This is on top of your standard FPS staples like shotguns and assault rifles, and there are perfectly placed environmental hazards that are also begging to be utilised too. The limit is what your sick little mind can come up with. It's a very dumb game and by no means the best on this list, but the action is solid and constant through its roughly 8 hour campaign. The bodies pile up thick and fast in this one and the regular gratification from having your kills graded quickly desensitises you, to the point where it almost feels cathartic. Saw the video game was released on PS3, Xbox 360 and PC back in 2009 and is canonical within the Saw universe, with its campaign taking place between the first and second movies. As the game starts, Jigsaw has healed Detective Tap from his gunshot wound and places him in an insane asylum to teach him a lesson in life appreciation. Obsessed with the Jigsaw killer, Tap traverses the asylum, gathering clues, all while trying to keep his sanity and his body intact. <laughs> A third-person survival horror game with light action elements, the primary objective is to make your way through and then eventually out of the asylum, surviving all of Jigsaw's BS along the way. And the BS I speak of comes in the form of outlandish and elaborate traps designed with suffering and cruelty in mind. Occasionally, you will need to fend off other people Jigsaw has taken hostage within the asylum, and Tap has a few abilities up his sleeve to achieve this. He can block and counter, then use any weapon he may have found whilst exploring, but I'll be honest with you, these encounters can get a little frustrating, as the combat mechanics in general are probably the weakest element of the game. Its story, the multiple endings, and the outrageously gnarly kill traps that you have to puzzle your way out of leave you squirming and wincing your way through most, if not all, of this game, and are easily its highlights. Not one for the squeamish, some of the death animations and torture scenes are genuinely horrendous, but if you consider yourself a fan of the movie franchise and haven't played this yet, then I highly recommend checking it out to add another piece of Jigsaw's puzzle into this elaborate torture saga. And next up we have The Last of Us, the incredible third-person action survival game from Naughty Dog. In the harsh new world humanity has found itself in, violence is the new common language and you'll need to be fluent if you intend on surviving it. Whether that's quietly strangling an unsuspecting individual blocking your path to more scavenging opportunities, thrusting a homemade shiv into the neck of an infected or bludgeoning someone to a pulp using a lead pipe, 
There are many ways to engage with potential threats in this game and those I just mentioned were only some of the more discreet options. You can go loud too with an array of firearms, Molotov cocktails and lovingly handcrafted grenades that can absolutely decimate your enemies. There are far more violent games to come but they tend to fall into the video gamey surreal where The Last of Us feels all too real. It's not action all the way though, there are moments of exploration and a few laughs here and there as Ellie and Joel's relationship deepens but that only enhances the violence when the proverbial does hit the fan. It really comes with an impact that is genuinely shocking. These flashes of violence that can erupt out of nowhere are a masterclass in building tension and sustaining it. The character animations when in combat feel grounded and realistic. The frenzy of clickers hurtling in your direction once they have echolocated you never stops being genuinely terrifying. And popping those mushroom craniums with a perfectly placed headshot always fills you with relief and is genuinely satisfying to pull off. Still the poster child of Sony's first party offerings, there's a reason it's featured on more numbered PlayStation consoles than not, with dedicated PS3, PS4 and PS5 versions. One of the greatest video games ever made also happens to be one of the most violent. I'm the best there is at what I do. At least the people still living after I'm done doing it say that. X-Men Origins Wolverine Uncaged Edition is a gory hack and slash third person action game befitting the much loved Marvel superhero. The M rating ensured the developers weren't held back when it came to the violence and thank god as the last thing anyone wants is a dedicated Wolverine game without the bursts of animalistic rage. The combat itself taking influence from other greats in the genre such as God of War and Devil May Cry, it primarily consists of light attacks, heavy attacks, grabs and killer lunges. The environment can also be utilised such as taking advantage of a few courteously placed spikes to do a spot of redecorating. And all of the above contribute in building up Wolverine's rage meter which when full can be unleashed as a flurry of furious attacks. And there's even a berserk mode which lets Wolverine go absolutely ham on anyone in his path until his rage meter has depleted. Coinciding with the release of the movie of the same name, X-Men Origins the video game is by far the better of the two. Voiced by Jackman and featuring his likeness, you'll have a great time playing as him as he tears and shreds his way through countless enemies, painting his surroundings in a lovely shade of claret. Genuinely ferocious, if you're into your action games and haven't tried this yet, then I highly suggest grabbing a copy. Also available on DS, Wii, PS2 and PSP, even mobile, but these versions are the watered down, much less violent iterations. If you want the raw to the core gore, you need the uncaged edition. With a collaboration between legendary game designer Suda51 and acclaimed filmmaker James Gunn, you know you're going to be in for a ride and Lollipop Chainsaw does not disappoint. The world is as colourful and sparkly as it is violent and deadly and the game sets up the lore of that world brilliantly. 
playing as chainsaw-wielding cheerleader Juliet Starling during the opening moments of a zombie outbreak, you will swing and dance your way through countless enemies decapitating half a dozen or so zombies in one fell swoop, all with glitter bomb and rainbow effects exploding as you do so. It's mental and unlike anything else on the console. It's all about combos and chaining them together feels incredibly satisfying and gets really addictive. Gaining high scores and points from how efficient you deal with the enemies can then be converted into new moves and abilities for Juliet to use. By the end of the game, Juliet's repertoire of devastating moves is quite formidable and a genuine spectacle to watch. It's not a perfect game, there are some chinks in the armour, but overall you'll have a blast carving your way through town, turning zombies into mints and devastating the game's bosses. I once called my own had found its holy grail, the key to human immortality. Or so we thought. It did not bring salvation. It brought doom. Marker bred insanity, murder, and chaos. It bred necromorphs. The second game on this list from dynamic duo Visceral Games and EA, that relationship eventually broke down with the studio's closure in 2017, something I still haven't got over, we have Dead Space 2. A total of three mainline games released on the console and you could have picked any of them for this list. I've decided to go with two as it's my favourite of the bunch, but like I said any and all of them would be a fine choice for a list like this as violence and gore is Dead Space's bread and butter. And to be quite honest with you, few have done it better. A survival horror game set on a space station orbiting Titan, the largest of Saturn's moons. It follows series protagonist Isaac Clarke as he fights against a viral outbreak of necromorphs undead creatures that take on hideous forms and are incredibly tricky to fend off. Luckily Isaac gets his hands on some gadgets throughout the game that can dramatically assist in keeping him alive. Even after pouring a mag full of bullets into these things they can still make a beeline for you and in the tight and cramped corridors of a space station things can get out of hand really quickly. Removing limbs is your best option and switching between weapons that have either a vertical or horizontal line of fire will depend on the enemies you're encountering. Other abilities like stasis is also hugely invaluable, freezing enemies mid-air for a short period of time so that you can line up a headshot. Or kinesis, which allows Isaac to pull items like iron rods out of the environment so that you can launch them back, momentarily pinning an enemy to a wall. The cramped environments of most of the levels make the violence feel that much more up close and personal, rarely giving you a moment's peace. Truly terrifying. Before the reboot of the franchise on the PS4 in 2018, Kratos was generally considered as one of, if not the angriest dudes in video games. His quest for revenge against the gods that made him kill his family is relentless and unwavering, and genuinely befits the tales of Greek tragedy the game borrows its tropes from. 
With an assortment of creatures from Greek mythology like centaurs, harpies, cyclops and minotaurs etc, there's always something new for Kratos to discover and then pound to the ground. With a hack and slash combat system in the third person using a fixed camera perspective, you will guide Kratos as he makes his way through Mount Olympus, murdering the gods of antiquity one by one. Primarily using the Blades of Exile, during the course of the game Kratos eventually gets his battle-hardened hands on a few extra toys to play with, all adding to his already stacked roster of fighting skills. The standard enemies you come across feel the wrath well enough, but the boss fights is where you see why he is the god of war. The weight behind every punch is just so crunchy, the anger and rage is so well captured, it's just a very furious game. The quick time events can be a bit hit or miss for some people, but I think they genuinely add some value to these big epic boss fights. Dead Island is set, as you can imagine, on an island the night after an epic party. Hungover and dehydrated, the four playable characters of the game awaken to hear the voice of an emergency intercom system directing them to evacuate the hotel. They soon discover that the majority of the island's population have been overcome by a contagious and infectious plague, turning them into flesh-eating zombies. Your standard zombie affair story-wise, but the gameplay is where this game shines. Set in an open world environment with surprisingly large areas to explore, the game is a checklist of quests but the combat can get incredibly chaotic and messy in an instant. Primarily relying on melee weapons, you have to get up close to the enemies to deal any sort of damage most of the time, giving you a front row seat to all the gruesome and sloppy kill animations. You know what you're getting into the minute you pick up this game and to be fair to it, it doesn't disappoint. The idyllic and bright setting of the island provides a beautiful contrast to the blood and carnage that regularly fills your screen. A contrast you don't often see from games within this genre, but don't let its idyllic setting fool you into thinking that this game isn't worthy of its M rating. The game wasn't even released in Germany at the time of launch as it was deemed media harmful to youth, which as history has shown only ever succeeds in making the game more desirable to said youths. It is violent though to be fair and very very bloody. Did I say it was gonna be fun? You're gonna have to learn to love the pain. There's a lot more of it to come. Horror-themed beat-em-up Splatterhouse 2010 is a reinvention of a classic arcade and 16-bit era 2D side-scroller, this time fully rendered in 3D and featuring gallons more blood. Literally, it's not often when playing this game that every inch of space on screen isn't covered in someone's vital fluids. Primarily using his bare hands, the game's protagonist Rick dons a mask that gives him super strength and a pissed off attitude. With his girlfriend kidnapped by a mad necrobiologist, Rick sets off to rescue her, slashing, ripping and tearing the ripping and the tearing. his way through countless demons and monsters in order to reach her in time. The constant barrage of violence in this game is genuinely something to behold. From the numerous moves Rick unlocks as the game progresses to the weapons he finds that can bludgeon an enemy in one hit, this game is full on. Rick can even beat his enemies with his own dismembered arm for God's sake and all of that is nothing compared to the various animated cutscenes of splatter kills. Gloriously gory finishing moves that stop the action momentarily so that you can bask in the blood soaked splendour. With access to the entire back catalogue of Splatterhouse games just through game progression, you certainly get your money's worth in terms of gore and bloody violence with this one. And as stated in the intro, if I'm ranking a game based on how violent and bloody it is, then Splatterhouse 2010 wins hands down.
Whew, that was a bit intense, wasn't it? Well done for making it this far. Have some chilled beats and footage of puppies to settle the nerves and restore balance. But there you have it, that was my top 20 most violent and bloody video games on the PS3. I kept the descriptions relatively brief to keep the video's runtime down, but a few of them I've already featured on the channel and go into more detail, so check out some of my older uploads if you want to see extended footage and hear more of my thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, have a think about hitting the like button as it genuinely helps out quite a bit, and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Also, please let me know what games I missed. These are just the ones I own in my collection, but I'm always on the hunt for more. That's going to wrap things up here though, so thanks for watching and until next time, take care, be good, game on.